Five Nights at Freddy's is based upon the game series of the same name by Scott Cawthon, who also wrote the screenplay and the screen story. I definitely think he wanted to make sure his vision was respected. With the screen story, he was assisted by Chris Lee Hill and Tyler McIntyre, and the screenplay was co-written by Seth Cudderback and Emma Tammy, the latter of which also directed. It stars Josh Hutcherson, which is harder to say than you think, Piper Rubio, Elizabeth Lale, Matthew Lillard, who is always great, and strangely enough, Matthew Patrick, but we'll get to that. So, as usual with any recent films, and obviously it depends on when this goes out, but I'll still hold to it, I will avoid spoilers in the first section, and then I will clearly say spoilers beyond this point or whatever, and do some spoilery bits towards the end. So you can watch the first part and not get anything really spoiled. I'll try to do my best. I am aware that the game series has existed for a while, so I might say things that technically would be a spoiler for the film, but not for the games, but I'll try not to. So with all that preamble out of the way, my experience of the games is primarily as a passive viewer. I'm not big on, you know, sort of uh, jump scares and that kind of thing. And whilst you could argue, if you're good at these games, the Five Nights at Freddy's series, you're not going to get jump scared, but that's how you learn the new mechanics, etc. Especially in the first one, no one knew how to properly monitor the power levels with the doors and everything. So you learn through being jump scared. And it's just not something that works for me. Watching someone else play on YouTube, and I know there are other YouTubers, by the way, in this, apart from the ones that I know, but I'm not going to talk about the ones that I don't know because I don't know them. But, you know, watching these people, I mean, for me, it was mainly Markiplier, who unfortunately couldn't be part of the film due to scheduling with his own film. But I prefer to sort of do that because I can laugh at their reactions and it's a little safer for me. So I'm aware of all the lore and, yeah, you know, game theories helped with some of the lore as well, like sort of rounding out some things and new theories that I might not have thought of myself. Additionally, delving into the books and things like that has helped to get new perspectives. And I will say I'm in the camp that... I guess to borrow from DC, it's kind of like an Elseworlds situation, or if you want to look at it from a Loki perspective, these were like variants, branch timelines. So the game series is one timeline, one route, if you will. Then the books are their own thing, which have similarities but differences, and you can use elements in one to perhaps understand the other better. And now I think with this film and any subsequent sequels that may come out, that will be its own thing, but again, you're going to have elements of the games and the books that cross over and you know, back from the film as well, I'm sure, in the future. The fact that this is a retelling of the first game with new elements folded back in, I think, works in its favour too. Mike Schmidt is literally the player character in the first one. We bring most of his personality to him. They couldn't do that for a film, it wouldn't be engaging, so to make it cinematically rewarding to watch, they gave him a backstory that, yes, still ties him into the overarching thing, you know, the overarching issues, the overarching plot, of this series, but not in such a direct way as it's been, I don't know, figured out, I guess, over the years. And the fact that we're bringing in things that have happened since, because obviously in the first game, you can't predict that you'd have Springtrap for arguments. You can't predict you'd have, you know, Vanessa. You couldn't predict all these things. So folding it back into the original story through a new perspective, you can bring these things in. You can actually make these connections and I think it, I th like I say, I think it really works in its favour. Whilst I'm not saying this is uh, the best film in the world, I'm still not saying it's absolutely awful. I think a lot of people may have come to it with certain expectations which haven't been met. That some people may have wanted literally a retelling of the entire series up to date or a literal one-to-one -one of the game, but that wouldn't work. You're not controlling it. It's 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 that removal again. Whilst I still enjoyed watching people play, it is not the same as doing it yourself, and it's it's certainly boring for a general audience just to sit watching CCTV monitors and doors opening and closing. That's, that's not going to engage people, so you've got to build it out. And I'd like to say, I think it did it well. The the conflict the, the sort of, in, in the family and things like that were good. And like I say, performances were great across the board. And if you enjoy the games, I think, go and watch it. If you enjoy, you know, like middle of the road, let's say, horror films, you know, with some quite horrific scenes, actually. There's one particular death scene that I was not quite prepared for. I didn't expect it to be quite that brutal, but I liked it. I enjoyed it, if that makes sense. So if you like that kind of thing, yeah, you know, give it a watch. Don't expect amazing quality, but give it a chance. I think you'll enjoy it. So to talk any further, I'm, I felt very constrained in that first part, so I'm, I'm putting the spoiler warning up here. 
because I really want to talk about a few things and they may be considered spoilers for the film, even if they're not for the games. So, the first thing is Matt Pat, Matthew Patrick himself. And I guess this could have gone in the earlier bit, but I didn't want to spoil anything if I could avoid it. So, him as the waiter was quite interesting, actually, because he does have a theatre background, so he can act, and we know that, it's fine. And his performance is great here. It's it's what you'd expect. But the fact that his badge says Ness on it was something I picked up on. Because one of the most controversial game theory theories is that Sans from Undertale is basically the skeleton of Ness from Earthbound. If we don't have a skeleton, it from that di- say something happens to the diner and you know someone's coming through like trying to trace what happened before, and there's not a skeleton of Matt Pat's character from this film in the corner with a glowing blue eye for some reason, I'll be very disappointed. Or maybe fold it into like Ennard if they do that. I don't know. But anyway, that's all I want to say about the Matt Pat cameo. I thought it was great. But some of the elements here that I I enjoyed. I enjoyed both of these, but I could tell what was going on. I think the first one, I'll do the one that people probably aren't as hyper aware of, should we say, Abby. It's about A-B-B-Y. As soon as I saw that name, as soon as I realised that was her name, spelt that way, and we saw an animatronic with kind of like a girl's face with pink cheeks, and at one point she was trying to be forced into it, and who is the animatronic girl thing with pink cheeks? Oh, it's Baby, which is an anagram of Abby. That was one of those that annoyed me. I, I've said before, I love it when films give me little, you know, breadcrumbs that I can follow and I like sometimes figuring them out ahead of the time. Sometimes I don't, and this was one of them. I was like, oh, don't. Don't make it so that she's going to be shoved into the baby thing. You know, instead of like the big scooping thing that we've seen for Elizabeth, instead turn it into like another Springlock thing. Fine, you know, but I... I didn't like the fact... If she was called anything else... I mean, if she was called Elizabeth, I'd have probably rolled my eyes a bit as well, so I don't know, but... I just... It, it just didn't hit me in the same way, because I was predicting it was going to go the, the less ideal way, from my perspective. Now, the other one... You don't get someone of Matthew Lillard's calibre and just have him as a career counsellor. That is not what you do. It was very clear that he was going to be William Afton, and... It's, this is this is less egregious and annoying than the Abbey thing, because it was really, really obvious. I think even in interviews, it's like, oh yeah, my, my, my role's quite important. And you could argue that at the start of the film, you know, he's the one who gets Mike the job, so that's really important. You could still sell it that way, but we all knew when that was said, that's not the case, this is Afton. I did love the end of the film, though, turning him into, like, Springtrap, technically, like, when he's in the suit. I love that, because that means that now in sequels, we'll hopefully have Matthew Lillard as the Springtrap version of Afton, like this undead thing just driven by revenge and hatred. And I'm excited for that, because Matthew Lillard is a great physical and vocal performer. The fact that he took over as Shaggy because he did so well in the Scooby-Doo film says a lot. But there's a lot here to love, and that's why, you know, it's been hard. The reveal of Vanessa as part of the Afton family, I guess, was to swap it from Mike. Although I believe there are elements in the games. I can't remember much of Security Beach and Ruin. A lot of people, I think, have wiped it from their brain. I might have to look back. But I'm not sure she's explicitly considered part of the Afton family in that. I am not. I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case. Let's put it that way. It does feel familiar. But I do like the fact that they made sure it's cemented here so we still have that direct connection to the Afton family if we weren't having Mike as part of the family. His history, though, as well, was interesting. The idea of his brother being kidnapped, being one of, you know, the original victims, if you will, of Afton, and being helped along by the spirits of the others. Now, the interesting thing is, we see the core animatronics, for the most part, but there's this one lead kid. Those of us who've got a massive history, like we saw, you know, the thing on the mirror, it's me, all of that kind of stuff. This lead kid is meant to be, obviously, Golden Freddy, the ringleader of sorts for the earlier parts before the puppet was introduced now whether we'll have a different situation with the puppet maybe the puppet will be garrett in the future it could happen but i did like how they gave those dream things and it was clear who was who you had a kid with like a little top hat on that's obviously normal freddy kid with the hook is obviously foxy the girl wearing yellow chica etc um obviously the kid with the, the ears being bonnie and I like the fact that they made it make sense. I like the little balloon boy. I guess jump scares of sorts, but they were very mild. 
there's a lot here, you know, that if if you know the games and if you know all the lore and you're willing to let some of the issues slide. Like I said in the pre spoil a bit. It's fun. I, I enjoyed my time with it. I don't think it's amazing, but I've definitely seen a lot worse. And worse adaptations of games. So I think we're out of the worst of, of, of the time period of that. But yeah, so I enjoyed this for what it was. I know that it's flawed, but hopefully sequels will improve upon the formula and give us more lore as we go on. So that's all I want to say about Five Nights at Freddy's. So thank you very much for letting me talk about this. As always, and until next time, take care.